our first panel for today is uh, going to be the provider panel. So for the provider panels, this is really we have gathered a couple of uh, healthcare providers from across the region to share with you about their insights into innovation and what they do at their respective markets and organization. So let's welcome on stage our moderator for today, Peter Chow, COO from IHH Healthcare Singapore, and our panelists, Dr. Melvin Heng, GCEO Thomson Medical Group, Dr. Ritu Garg, Chief Growth and Innovation Officer I, for this healthcare, and Dr. Nam Tantuanit, Partner Healthcare Strategy and Transactions at EY. So Peter, I'll hand over the mic to you for, to continue. The mic's there. Okay, test, testing. Okay. Um, very good afternoon to everyone. Um, I think I can speak for my panelists to say that we are very, very privileged to be the inaugural panel of the inaugural Innovation Forum, uh, which is why I'm going to choose my first question to the panel very, very carefully. If you um, realize, we have a very, very esteemed panel uh, coming with operating experience in different geographies and different markets. And I'm not sure, I did a rough count, if you look at the population of the markets that they represent or they have experience in, I think it works out to be about 2 billion easily, right? Yeah. So I hope all of you uh, innovators, entrepreneurs out there will take the opportunity to uh, ask any questions. Uh, feel free to either maybe put up your hand or I think that there is actually a, a, a portal that you can enter your questions into. If not, just put out your hand uh, and, and I will actually uh, ask you to share your questions. But first, let's start off by uh, asking them to maybe share a little bit about the various markets that they operate in and what is that whole healthcare innovation space or the interest like in those respective markets, right? Um, who would like to start first? I was saying we should let the, the lady that's taking care of 1.4 billion people <laughs> and ladies first. Okay. Isha? Yeah, okay, cool. Fine. All right. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. So I represent Fortis Healthcare. Um, I'm from India. India is a nation of 1.4 billion people. So that's the majority of 2 billion that Peter spoke about. <laughs> Um, Fortis has got 27 healthcare hospitals uh, in India and we run about 4,500 plus pets. Um, India has been on the forefront for healthcare innovation for a long time. Um, on the startup ecosystem, uh, we are the world's third largest startup ecosystem in the world. There are about 80,000 startups that work in India, out of which about 8,000 are in healthcare, $2 billion valuation at the moment, um, and growing at a 40% CAGR. That does speak a little bit about the ecosystem, the will, the capability, um, and the opportunity in India for innovation, specifically in healthcare. I think one of the brilliant uses or, or examples of the innovation for us has been the COVID. Um, I think the, probably the only country in the world to vaccinate 1.4 billion people with indigenous vaccine at a cost of less than 10 US dollars. Um, so that kind of sets the tone of what the capability looks like. As of today, um, what the opportunity, where it lies, um, so there is a very ambitious scheme that the government launched. Um, it's the Ayushman Bharat mission. that was launched about five years ago, um, and it had three components. So first was building the capability and stepping up the public health infrastructure, which meant that the number of medical colleges, as well as the preventive health systems, um, are uh, you know, being built as we speak uh, to cater to the supply chain. And then the second, which was to insure the large population. So that's again 550 million people who have been insured with $6,000 uh, plus health insurance annually. Um, and that opened up access to a lot of people. And third most ambitious is the digital health mission, which is to create a one of its kind unified digital health ecosystem and bring in a lot of uh, stakeholders, be it insurance companies, providers, so on, through data interoperability. What it means is that just like a FinTech and a UPI space or unified payment interface, you could have your health records moving in from one provider to another. 
Of course, there are challenges to it because we don't have a full adoption of EMR today. Also, the structured data is, is kind of limited because there's no standardization of codes. But all that work is happening now. So my view is in about three to five years, India would have the largest structured clinical data. And that opens up immense possibilities to run generative AI, uh, to run um, any kind of models um, on it, which probably nobody else in the world could do. Um, so that's the big space to watch out for. Um, as Ashok said, oncology, of course, world over, there's been an explosion. So there's a lot of work happening on that side. We are likely to have, again, indigenous CAR T cells. Um, I think first company to get uh, CAR T cell um, authorization from reg regulators is happening this year. So that's another big one. Anything with genomics, liquid biopsy, um, again, uh, you know, huge runway, uh, because there's a lot more uh, that's coming up there. And then there is adoption of 3D. Um, implants and, and others as well. Okay. Thanks, Ritu. Um, thank you. Balvin, do you want to go? Sure. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, happy to be here. See a lot of familiar faces. I, I was previously from IHH, I was at Glen Eagles. Uh, and my background is that um, I am a doctor by training, I'm very passionate about healthcare. I left to be an entrepreneur. I was uh, in the primary care space. Uh, I was also in aeromedical evacuations. I exited my companies. I also had another company we sold to a Hong Kong listed company for uh, electronic medical records. Uh, I'm interested in uh, looking at biomarkers. So I have another company looking at metabolomics and uh, very, very also interested in the immunological space and the cascades that actually determine whether CAR T cell is uh, effective, you know, sometimes needing to make sure that we are removing patients that get cytokine storms and, you know, and increasing the, 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 the your margin of, of success. So, so those are some of my backgrounds that I'm very interested in. Oh, I had another teleradiology company in Berlin as well um, before I exited and joined IHH. Now I'm with Thompson. Uh, Thompson, I've been there for the last uh, eight, nine months. Um, currently, the geographies that I cover will be Singapore. Uh, in Malaysia as well, we have a uh, hospital, 550 beds and five IVF clinics. So we have a very strong interest in reproductive medicine. Uh, recently, we just closed an acquisition of a 250 bed hospital in Vietnam with uh, three uh, chiropractic clinics and one ambulatory care center in uh, District 1. So very interested to, in the area that is uh, actually developing. Um, in all the geographies, we are seeing a lot of growth especially in a Southeast Asia, um, now traveling and looking at the opportunities post-pandemic. We have seen a lot of governments realign their budgets, um, putting a lot more uh, uh, um, um, concentration on delivering healthcare to a larger population subset. Uh, that has brought about extremely dif different and interesting conversations about universal healthcare, about um, uh, being able to, 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 to meet the demands of the population without breaking the bank. And uh, I think these conversations are extremely precious for healthcare providers like us. And there's also for uh, exciting times for companies that are actually innovating and building products that actually will help uh, to leverage on these opportunities to enter the healthcare space. So happy to have this conversation with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Melvin. Nam, please. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, very happy to be here. Thanks to SUNIVATE and IHH for, for having me. A um, bit about myself. So I started life as an internal med and a rehabilitation physician many years ago. So I feel like I was a bit ahead of my time. Back then, preventive care, wellness, rehabilitation wasn't uh, seen as important as some of the acute disciplines. But now, certainly, we're all... Um, heading towards that way where uh, prevention and uh, both primary, secondary, and uh, thanks to COVID, uh, people are paying more attention to, to their well-being. Um, and then I, uh, as you can see behind me, uh, my second career was as a uh, hospital administrator. So I ran uh, Bamangrad Hospital in, in Thailand, which is a single facility. We saw over 1 million patients a year and probably one of the pioneers of medical tourism in, in, in the region. And then uh, after that, Omni Hospital in Indonesia, which uh, had four hospitals across the uh, greater Jakarta area. Um, now I, uh, my third career is as a management consultant. So next I might be an entrepreneur like you, uh, Melvin. <laughs> 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 so 
Sure, but um, I guess uh, my my experience in Thailand, you know, having run Bamongrad, which is probably the you know the the, the most premium uh, facility in the country, it's a wide spectrum to what the the, the whole country is facing now, which is uh, 70 million people. Um, we have universal health care, but uh, we we shifting, of course, like everyone else, from this uh, this business model from fee for service to value based care to address the rising costs. We're shifting from a doctor-centric to a patient-centric model, which means that um, you know, we're paying more attention to personalised medicine. You talked about uh, genomics, pharmacogenomics, and uh, prevention and wellness. And then we're shifting from the infrastructure model from being hospital-based, we just don't have enough facilities, we just can't build it fast enough, to uh, a more decentralised and uh, um, virtual remote home care model as well. And I think that, that probably goes across um, all the regions. But you can see underlying all three challenges is technology. We need to innovate um, you know, to, to be value-based care. We need data analytics to, to make sense and to see where we can um, improve on the efficiencies. Um, for personalised uh, medicine, we've touched on liquid biopsy, genomics. How do we get um, individuals to um, you know, sort of uh, get to the best level of, of treatment outcomes for that individual, including prevention, which is what Singapore is trying to do, this precision population health. Um, and the, the third one, of course, is with decentralised care. You talked about integrating. Uh, we have to be able to share data across different providers, from hospitals to clinics to, to um, families in the home. Um, uh, how do we integrate that? How do we share data with the right guardrails in place? Um, and how do we get data the other way from patients uh, home back into the, the care providers so that they can respond in a timely manner? So I think, you know, sort of innovation um, and, and technology is going to go, I mean, it's crucial for us to make this shift to address all the challenges that, that we all face across the region. Thanks, Dump. So I think what I'm hearing from the three panelists is there are actually several uh, common themes in different markets and different regions. Uh, access to healthcare being one of them, uh, digitalization uh, being one of them. And of course, there are some very, very specific areas like what Melvin mentioned as, uh, for example, cellular level treatment and so on and so forth. But I wanted to ask the three of you, uh, given that our topic today is how to get through the window or the door, right? But of, co of course, you've also noticed that Melvin, in sharing uh, his, uh, what he has been doing, he started off uh, as a healthcare innovator and entrepreneur, but obviously he got through the door so well <laughs> that he became a healthcare provider, right? But uh, I wanted to ask the three of you, uh, this idea of a door or a window actually connotates that there is actually a separation between the innovation space and the provider space. What do you think of it? Is it a, a imaginary door or is there a real door that actually separates that two space? And I think from a provider point of view, uh, how much of your resources do you actually spend uh, doing in-house innovation? And how much effort do providers spend actually going out there into the landscape to look for solutions? Um, you're right. Um, I don't think we do enough um, as a provider space. Um, and there is always a priority and a bandwidth issue, right? Because you have your day job, uh, which is also running the, you know, the current business. Um, having said that, um, I think today the healthcare providers are also uh, very open because we also have to differentiate, right? Uh, you know, it is getting uh, competitive. The space is getting very competitive. Even in India, there are multiple healthcare providers. There's an opportunity, but it's also a competitive space. In which case, there is uh, the only way to survive or thrive is to do it differently, which means that there's an inherent interest in innovation for sure. I think the window is there. Um, it's just that, you know, you need people to knock it on the door and knock it uh, and, and be there when the window opens. Uh, because many times what happens is that there is a fleeting assumption that nobody will be willing to listen and also sometimes um, the homework is not enough so what happens is that you know when initial meetings happen and there is not enough understanding of what the market looks like or what there is a real need those conversations then don't 
end up in something meaningful and fruitful and that kind of leaves both the parties a little bit disappointed so my suggestion would be that you know um, obviously that you know the agility and innovative ideas are with in the startup ecosystem and big players are not agile enough that's a problem and and it's there uh, but um, I think all the healthcare providers are willing to listen because we frankly have no choice. You know, we need to differentiate ourselves and it makes a lot of business sense to adopt new ideas as early as possible. So window is there, it's just that we have to meet more often, a little bit more structured manner so that it gets fructified for both the, both parties. Yeah, I think Peter, you're talk I think that I, I see two parts, right? Um, I think a lot of healthcare companies are, are starting to do a lot more internal corporate ventures, you know, um, ground up, um, bringing in uh, investments and then trying to disrupt themselves from within. I think that is great. And the only thing I can comment is that the structure of the organization needs to be fertile for these innovations to then grow and take place. Uh, and putting those structures and thinking very hard about them, super important. I think one thing that a lot of people are probably here to hear about is, you know, um, let's say I'm a startup and I'm here, which is where I've been in uh, the shoes I've been in before. And I'm pitching to a corporation, I'm pitching to an organization such as ICH, for example. You know, how do I get through that door? And does that door actually exist in the first place? And I do think it actually, unfortunately, it does. And I don't think it, it happens because uh, of any intention, but I think it's trying to get the understanding. For example, for, for the startup and for the innovation, we have a, sometimes we have a very idealistic view of how things are done. I just had this chat with some of my, the panelists and um, just now I said, you know, we have, I, it, the idealistic idea is that, oh, if I want to get data, I'll go to the electronic medical records and I'll pull up data and I'll know what happened to the patient day by day. <laughs> and, and when someone told me that before, I was like, well, I, I think you should pull data from the, the bill. Because I, I, I don't think my doctors fill in the electronic medical records very well, but they, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they charge the patient for what they do. So when you start to look at your chronological experience of the, of the patient's journey in the hospital, actually, if you, are very, if you understand the processes and the behavior on the ground, it, it, it puts you in a much better position because now you are looking at things from the pro from the process and from the providers and the operators' perspective. And you also are, have a higher success rate because now you know where to get the, the clean data. Now you know where to get the right data. If I know that he's moved to the ICU and oh no, he's on oxygen, you know where the patient's trajectory is going. So that, that for one, I think is extremely important, trying to sit, go to the ground and really stand and understand. And if you, if, if you have a very idealistic perspective and it's all on PowerPoint and it's not I've come to your business office, I've stand, stood there for the last six hours, I've seen how the processes work, this is what we think, but this is what you're doing, and this is what you think, and how can we get closer? I think that gives your proposition a lot of value. Okay, so that's one. For the provider, I mean, I have been an operator as well, and I see some great innovations that come in, and we, we want to get them on, and then I say, oh, how long is legal going to take? Um, <laughs> so. The, the process of, of getting innovations through is also not easy because they, there, will, there, will be a, there will be a chasm sometimes between what is expected and what you need to do as a provider to bring it in. Um, I always tell um, startups that, hey, you, know, you need to pitch to the right sponsor, the right person. You need to know what his objectives are. Is it strategic? Is it process? Is it uh, 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 labor-saving? And at every level, someone needs a return on their investment. And if you can't get true to that uh, person, it's very hard. And your sponsor also, you need to understand how much money he has. So for the, 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 the company that's trying to get in, um, I would say you need to know there are limits of authority for the person. How, what's, what kind of check size is he going to be able to write? If you give him something that is over his ability, then you're just going to have to go to the next level and then you have to pitch it again. At the same time, the, for the organization, of course, you shouldn't be telling people what kind of check size you can do. They have to figure out themselves. But, but in the corporate structure, that exists. And unfortunately, for startups, that, uh, for entrepreneurs that might not have gone through that process, navigating this is actually an educational experience in itself. And I, I think that is extremely important to be cognizant of all these hurdles that you have to jump through in order to get through the window. Thank, thank you.
Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. Pitching to the CEO is probably the worst person to do. <laughs> and I don't uh, envy, I mean, when I was the CEO, just reflecting, you know, you're, you're so focused on the just immediate issues and then you're living month to month, quarterly to quarterly meetings, AGM to AGM. So focus on the, the business and the growth. Um, but at the same time, this duality of growth where you're focusing on what's next, what's going to give you competitive advantage and what's the next kind of uh, revenue uh, generating model innovation that you can bring in as well, which is probably three to five years out. So I guess to address, address the immediate needs, uh, we at Bumrung we had um, internal innovation competitions all the time and, and that's probably the best source of ideas where the people in different departments, different teams are actually seeing um, all the patient pain points and coming up with their own innovations. So that, that's our first source of kind of uh, fixing the immediate needs, the burning platforms where we have, we, we formalise it, we assess, uh, uh, assign a coach or, or a mentor from the management team and then work with them throughout the year and get them to a, um, a, a level where they can actually kind of bring that into uh, routine practice. Um, the other thing about bringing in um, innovations is, of course, um, it, it does, you know, create uh, uh, almost a, a conflict with the ongoing operations. So uh, I've seen models where, and we tried this at Bumming Road, where you have an, an incubation zone, where you have uh, one stakeholder, um, fund them um, for the year, and then fund, fund that innovation to um, certain milestones where you're pretty fine. Um, see if it's a, a, a good fit, if it's uh, addressing a real pain point, um, any errors, any um, uh, what, what the acceptance rate within that sandbox is, what the user uptake is, and then when it's mature enough, then pass it on to this um, transformation zone where it's, it's then all in, where the, every, all the C team, the CEO has to be in. We've decided this is going to work. Um, you put everything behind it and you, you know, sort of really um, beat the drums and rally the troops that everyone, this, this has got to work. Um, and then that can be, you know, sort of uh, the next uh, one to two years until it's fully adopted and then you reassess at the third year mark where um, it becomes, you know, sort of routine and then it become, helps your patient experience, helps your operational efficiencies, um, decrease medical error rates, whatever, and then, and then assess the ROI. So I think at each milestone you have different ROIs, different uh, KPIs of, of what success is. Um, so uh, a very positive thing in, in Thailand is Sirirat Hospital, one of our biggest um, public teaching hospitals, has adopted this model where they've almost created a, a, a different venture arm um, in partnership with a company called Kariva, which is also sponsored by PTT, which is a state-owned enterprise, um, uh, Kariva AI, to try and um, have an incubation um, uh, zone where they try things like um, pharmacogenomics, um, value-driven uh, outcomes, and using uh, gathering, harnessing all the data um, and using AI to, to make sense of it. So that's a very positive kind of model. Thailand's always been, I think, a little bit behind in, in, in embracing and uh, adopting um, innovations and health tech startups. But um, I think that attitude is quickly changing for, for the reasons I said before. And it's great to see that a, a public teaching hospital is, um, is, is kind of uh, adopting this, but they um, very well defined you know, outside of the day-to-day -day operations. And they're hoping to be a unicorn by 2028. So let's see how that goes. Thanks. So I think um, Nam mentioned something very interesting about Sirat Hospital and having an uh, 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 in, uh, innovation platform to help spin off some of these things. And I think earlier on, you have heard Ashok mention that even within IHH, we have a fund set aside. We have an entire arm looking at some of these uh, uh, areas of innovation that we can possibly adopt. But I wanted to ask the rest of you, right? I think uh, it's not necessarily the case where every single healthcare organization or provider have the benefit of some of these things. And I'm not sure whether, you know, sometimes uh, behind some of the companies that come to us, uh, what is the thinking behind how much resources that the provider organization actually has or does not have? Okay, and on that note, I wanted to ask you in the space that uh, you guys have been operating in, what can you think of are some of the very, very useful intermediary or support organizations or framework that could potentially come in as an intermediary between healthcare providers 
and some of the startups or some of the innovations that can actually help bridge that, that, that door or that window space. Um, so I think healthcare venture studios could be one. Um, I think in India also now, uh, we are seeing a lot of healthcare focused venture studios who uh, we are in touch with as well. Um, and we, uh, so the, the typically my conversation with them is that they are in touch with the startup ecosystem and idea is to deepen the engagement and uh, periodically we have a chat about what kind of innovation and startups have they been approached with and if there are any use cases. So um, over last like couple of months, I have had let's say evaluated about 10, 15 of them. Uh, where I would think that three or four make a lot of sense. And when I say a lot of sense, I think we are looking for only three aspects, right? One is that does it improve the quality? Quality as in either it improves the clinical outcomes or the patient experience. Second, it reduces the cost, so cost efficiency. And third would be access. I think if any of the startups ticks any of the boxes, then there is an interest. Now, obviously, what the parameter or KPI is going to be, that would happen once we have that conversation and start mentoring and talking to them. Uh, but for us, we would like to be the experimental ground. If you think that you've got an idea which, which sort of uh, you know, caters to any of the three things that I've listed, please, we are very open to have those conversations. Uh, we are very happy to get the clinical team. And one of the disconnects that I see all the time is that many times these clinical innovations don't have clinicians. Um, and I think that's where the gap is, because ultimately the implementation is going to happen in the hospital or in the wellness space, wherever. But you need a provider. You're in healthcare. You cannot innovate if there is not a provider who's endorsing your product. And I think one of the stiffest challenges that people face is that they don't have access to clinicians, especially the clinicians who are uh, you know, more open or wanting to do it. But you will be surprised at the number of clinicians who are a lot more open with new ideation and, and, and wanting to do that stuff. And and we can help bridge that gap. So to answer your question, I think healthcare venture studios could play a pivotal role in bridging this gap. I think in uh, the conversation with venture capital, with even startups that you know, approach the organization directly, I think is to be is for the organization to be open-minded about entertaining and listening um, and having a team that is able to absorb the ideas and, and look at the possible opportunity to implement them. Um, but uh, apart from that culture and that structure of receiving, the next part that um, I think Ritu pointed out, I think the, the word that you used was experiment, and I think that is, that's really the word, because we, we, you need to have a lab. This is like a laboratory where you actually test the idea and you work out the, the process, because seeing is believing, and sometimes having a, a clinic-level deployment or you know, a deployment that in a smaller department or a ward um, you, you need to really play it out. You need to really just run through the entire process and, and show that you know, it's more efficient, it's better, it's faster. And, and I think that needs the, the support of both um, the company that is implementing and also the, uh, the company that is taking in the innovation um, to, to build that safe space for experimentation. And then with that, you know, then you bring it from really from bench to bedside when you can say that, you know, this demonstrates the capability and we want to scale it up. Um, and I think it's really the, the investment of all parties to get to that stage. So it's quite interesting that both Ritu and Melvin spoke about provider and innovator coming together to do a, a co-innovation together. I wanted to read, read out this very interesting question that came from the floor. Uh, and ask you what you think about this. Um, the question asks, uh, or, or rather this is the comment that says, healthcare is inherently risk averse. Hence, new innovations are scary. <laughs> Procurement processes also makes partnership hard to structure. Any ideas to fix? So obviously, I, I think uh, this is maybe the person who asked this had always found it very hard to get through the door. But I wanted to tweak it a little bit beyond asking for your comments to ask if you think that uh, sometimes the mindset of the uh, enterprises or the innovators coming to healthcare providers, uh, do they necessarily just limit themselves to thinking about procurement? Uh, because obviously both of you spoke about something even more upstream about co-innovation. Right. Um, so what are your thoughts on some of these things? 
I think procurement is really, I mean, this is the last step because now you have kind of validated and you want to bring it the innovation in. Um, I think about the risk, it's true. Healthcare is, is a risky, very high uh, regulatory environment. But then again, a lot of the things that we are solving for are, are very rudimentary as well. Um, waiting at a clinic is a very low risk, rudimentary affair. And we have in Singapore limited space. And if you have a queuing system that is better, faster, more efficient, easier to use, in itself is innovation. We don't have to think very hard. In fact, I always tell people we don't really need to think so hard to look at where healthcare needs to innovate because the other sectors have already gone ahead. Um, booking a restaurant, booking a flight, um, choosing your meal on a plane. I think these are innovations outside that we just need to bring into the healthcare environment and solve for the um, constraints that we need to meet. Um, in the area of risk, I mean, let me give you a possible more risky kind of innovation. Let's say um, radiology um, um, AI, you know, where you try to maybe help the, 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 the radiologist to second read. And truthfully, we are seeing incremental um, smaller innovations lead to a larger innovation. When at the start, we were just looking at, you know, um, looking at um, demonstrating polyps in the colon, and that has been 20 years, 15 years already. You know, we have been do using such pro uh, 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 software and aiding the, the doctors. And actually, it's a suite of these products that come together that eventually gives you the uh, end stage innovation. I mean, teaching a computer how to, from the name of the person, guess the ethnicity of where they come from. It's, it's a very complicated process. We assume that it's so easy. We read a name and we say, oh, this guy might be of Indian origin. This person might be of Eurasian origin. And we think that that's that simple. But to teach a system that, and I think when you want to bring together a suite of healthcare innovation that's able to, with the ethnicity, with the rate of change of biomarkers, and their radiological image, give you a risk score of how they're likely they are going to end up in sepsis. I think, I mean, we want to get to that stage, of course, but I think now we just need to solve for the small, the small bits. And I think if, if companies are willing to, to work on the smaller bits, it's not st quite Star Trek, but we will get there. And I, I think it's the idea is to continuously move towards that, that, that goal. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I disagree with the statement that healthcare is risk averse. It's the riskiest, probably riskier than flying aircraft, right? I mean, the kind of accidents that happen in healthcare is, is enormous. It's just the priority of risk, right? Because you're dealing with lives, you better be risk averse. You know, you don't want to experiment on, you know, if you're putting somebody's life online. So I think in terms of priority, obviously managing the clinical risk is the first priority. That's yeah. given, you know, that cannot be negotiated upon. And then comes about, you know, are you, so then you decide that, you know, when you're expanding your universe, do you want to take risks on the service side? Maybe whether this technology will work or not work as long as it's not impacting the clinical outcome or it it, it's not having an adverse risk, uh, you know, I mean, that that becomes the defining point of which risk are you going to take and which you're not going to take as much. Mm. And I don't think procurement is, is, is what comes into mind of a healthcare provider. I don't think so. I think it's more about, you know, getting um, understanding of what is it that healthcare providers are looking for. And to me, um, anybody who's got a substantial value proposition, which um, addresses any of the, these two, three points that I spoke about earlier, uh, would be a conversation that we would love to have. Yeah, and I think um, trying to address uh, the, the correct pain points, and I keep coming back to this because too often I've seen um, startups coming and with a great idea, but it's just not you know an immediate need or addressing a, a, a patient safety concern, for instance. Um, but being willing to work together with the with the provider to to innovate and to to adapt your product as well. And there's a great example of um, Presage, which is, I'm not sure if anyone from the team's here, which is a, a bed fall prevention thermal imaging camera that's actually an AI platform detecting certain patterns of patient movement in the bed that would um, uh, kind of give an early warning of they're about to fall out of bed. Um, 
I think that you know, knowing your audience as well, you know, in a public hospital setting where bed falls and not enough staff to monitor um, is is you know one of the highest risk, and and a fall is anywhere is uh, disastrous. But um, you know, without paying too much attention to the oh, without um, paying too much attention to the ROI, the financial ROI, public hospitals can probably implement that. I think it's been implemented a lot in in Singapore. But they came to to ask me about as a private hospital CEO would. Would I put that in? And I said it's a great idea, but you know I can hire a, a special nurse. I can get the family to sit in and stop the patient from falling. So you know, with with, with their um, technology, I said, why don't you try and add in a couple of other use cases or parameters where you've got thermal imaging, you can do the heart rate, body temperature, respiratory rate, and then that gives more clinical parameters that can add up with your AI, uh, the patient movement pattern, maybe do an early warning score that the patient's about to, uh, maybe in delirium, they're about to have a, an acute event and so on. So just adapting that and be willing to work um, with the provider, I think they've got a lot more traction now that um, you know, they're addressing the core need, but also um, uh, addressing some other pain points with reducing um, nurses having to come in to check on the patient, to do vital signs and so on. So um, I think you know, being Agile and being able to adapt for for a startup, I think that's your that's your kind of core value anyway. Um, uh, and then and then working, there are providers that are willing to kind of sit down and 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 work through that with you. Yeah. So interesting that Nam mentioned about the example of false prevention, and I think uh, this is a pain point in most of us who are in healthcare uh, provision. Uh, but uh, on the flip side. I think early on we too mentioned about digitalization. Melvin mentioned about AI and all that. I myself, as a healthcare provider, find that we have a, a huge group of people uh, focusing on some of these areas and coming to us with ideas around these areas. So the whole uh, innovation space and the market space could be maybe overly congested. But I wanted to ask the three of you, as healthcare providers and from your experience, do you find that there would be any particular areas or pinpoints in healthcare where actually there may be a mismatch of the amount of innovation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the pinpoints of the provider? Which means to say that as providers, you have been actually looking false prevention being one of a very good example for the longest times for for the last 50 years hospitals have had been trying to deal with it with very, very limited success right would there be any other examples where you actually find that uh, we are not getting enough solutions or, or proposals and uh, there's not sufficient interest in that space uh, by innovators Something that can just change everybody's mindset would be a good start uh, because that happens to be your biggest block, right? Um, I think um, a, we, we would just need to have the clinicians on the same table. Unless that happens, I think those disconnect between the solutions that people are innovating for and what is the real use. Because I'm talking only about the hospital space. And, and there is obviously a lot of healthcare that is happening outside of hospital space, where it is direct to the consumer, where it is, you know, wearables and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm saying within the hospital space, um, I think a lot of it would need to, uh, you know, let's say we have been trying to find a solution to free up the bandwidth of some of our clinicians, right? And India, uh, the doctor's WhatsApp now numbers is just available everywhere um, and all the doctors all the patients keep you know kind of texting them all through the day and through the night um, and one of the conversations that I keep on having with the clinicians is that you know is there not an algorithm that can fix this issue so that if you know that you're doing a complex work um, and, and patients would likely to have XYZ questions uh, can that not be automated um, so that it frees up your bandwidth in, in looking at new patients or um, also the patients uh, you know doing the uh, within the hospital rounds and meeting them and so on. Um, so I think unless we have the clinicians and understand their pain points and address them within a hospital setting, that disconnect is likely to remain. Oh. Okay, thanks. I have a next question. Uh, maybe this one we will start with Melvin since you mentioned about AI. Um, so the, the question says, can you discuss the extent that you ask uh, that you use AI in your respective hospitals? Would you agree that uh, imaging is likely to be a good starting point? I think just joining Thompson, 
Um, currently, we do not have any significant deployments with AI. I have had conversations with imaging companies, and I'm sure some of you will know, some, some, uh, some hospital providers would have known some of these imaging companies that are uh, employing um, AI. Um, what the, the part is, uh, is it a good it's, starting it's point? It's a good starting point for, for imaging. Uh, there are multiple starting points. <laughs> so I, I, I would think that uh, imaging AI was something that started in probably sometime, maybe about a decade plus ago. I think I was actually at the, in Taiwan when the, at the Yonglin Foundation when uh, NVIDIA had a press release at 6 p.m. saying that they're going to move into the, the space. I should have bought stocks then. That was in 2014, 15, before that, sometime. And since then, I think the innovation in that space and the amount of computational power that is required for us to, to process um, imaging AI is, 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 has, has grown in leaps and bounds. Um, right now, we are still seeing that uh, most of the softwares are only solving for very specific use cases. So you might get um, uh, imaging software that works on MRI diffusion weighted imaging for stroke detection. Okay, and it's just stroke. It might not. It might you 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 will not have it for other types of. So we are still very very narrow uh, in in that. And I think as we build up more and more um, um, use cases and we aggregate them together, then it becomes something that actually becomes even more useful to the clinician. Mm -hmm. Um, so is it a good starting point? Yes, it is, because you have a multitude of clean data. You have data that comes in in a very structured way. The way that radiology pumps data out, everybody is using the same type of um, file, file type, the architecture of the, um, the, the, um, the, the, the database for acquisition and image storage is very standardized across the world. If you would use a Siemens or a GE product, they would have some interoperability at the back end database. So it's great. Another great place that you have good standardization of data is in ICU space where you're actually getting very clean data from the patients that are coming in and streaming in minute by minute, second by second. Your dialysis machines are actually collecting information every second. Uh, we don't we don't get this directly from the from the the, the vendors when we look at the clin clinical modules, but um, but within the, the the systems, they are collecting that kind of data second by second. So actually, if you are innovating something with such clean data, such high fidelity data, it's a very very good place to start. The t the parts when you get you start to get a little bit bummed up is really when you start dealing with unstructured data and you start dealing with data that has a lot of human behavioral elements that comes in and then you're not very sure whether your data is, is, is accurate or sometimes it's not timely and then that throws your ana analytics off. So if my answer would be, it is great because it's standardized and you can find a lot more places in healthcare that standardize. It's not the BR and all imaging is a great place to start but super lot of companies already in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I agree. I think imaging is is the uh, the obvious one, and probably the other two areas are pathology and, and dermatology, where it's more pattern recognition and machine learning. But I think another area of need is, uh, I mean, we've spoken about decentralized care, putting remote sensors uh, in patients' home and on patients. So um, obviously, we can't clinicians can't be monitoring um, all this data that's coming in in real time the whole time. So there needs to be um, AI definitely to um, filter and screen this this data with the different parameters and throw up red flags. Probably the threshold will have to be set a bit lower um, to so that um, the, the the potential danger um, cases can be can be uh, picked up and alerted in real time. Otherwise, um, this whole setup will, will not work. I wanted to follow up with Nam because I think there are two questions uh, that kind of addresses this. Number one is uh, specifically to Dr. Nam, to uh, uh, someone from the audience would like to hear examples of a great idea that isn't an immediate need, as you mentioned before. Uh, but I think there's also a related question that's, that asks that being healthcare providers, what are your thoughts on investing in an innovation that promotes the patient's well-being versus getting immediate financial uh, rewards, such as cost savings. 
So not sure whether you want to take both together. Yeah, I think the, the second one's interesting, and this, this came up, um, this comes up a lot, came up last week as well at HMA, where you know, we're, we're, we're promoting the use of technology for rehabilitation, for preventive care. Um, but, but who funds it? Who's going to pay for it? You know, I guess depends what hat I'm wearing. Uh, if I'm wearing a, a public health hat, then definitely you know, you'd, you'd be wanting to, to invest that, which is what a lot of governments are doing. But from a private provider perspective, obviously it's not going to be uh, an immediate return in, in, in terms of financial. But I think you would still um, want to do it, and, and Melvin, um, love to hear your thoughts on this. Because you are actually, you know, sort of um, uh, doing the, 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 the right thing by promoting, um, you know, patients to, to, to live healthier, to be in control of their chronic diseases. So technology is that whatever you can do that uh, to educate patients more. And I think from a, f uh, a private provider perspective, then you get more well, what we call customer loyalty, right, or, or lifetime uh, customer, and you get more traction. So if you look at it from that point of view, then that patient is not going to go anywhere else. So it's more, almost uh, an investment in a CRM where you, you're keeping them connected. Um, they'll be coming back. Obviously, they won't stay healthy 100%. So, so whenever there's blips in their chronic disease, they'll, they'll come back to you. Um, so I think it, it's the right thing to do, and I think it, it, it has you know, multiple other benefits as well, maybe not immediate uh, ROI return. And I forget the first question, uh, Peter. Um, examples of a great idea that uh, may not be an immediate need. Uh, uh, any examples? Yeah, maybe I can twist that a little bit. So um, a great idea that maybe wasn't ripe and we um, I invested in it, and then um, it's probably before its time. So you, you may have heard of IBM Watson for Oncology. Um, so Bamungrad, I that was me that invested a, a lot of money into that in 2015. That was probably ahead of its time. There was a lot of hype about this AI, clinical decision support, um, cloud um, uh, sourcing of data from different users around the world that would help us treat and cure cancer. Well, obviously, it was a lot more difficult ask back then. Um, and just it, it, the, the technology just wasn't mature enough. Um, it was a great idea at the time that uh, we invested, we, we backed, uh, but it turned out that it's, you know, I think last year the, the whole platform shut down. So sometimes great ideas, you really have to look under the hood and see what their technology is. I think, you know, we saw a, a clip of Watson winning Jeopardy and we were almost sold at that time that it's going to help us uh, cure cancer. So perhaps just a, a bit of a different twist to, to, to that um, question. Yeah. Are we uh, pressed for time? Uh, we have about two more minutes left for this panel, so maybe one last okay. question. Since we have, uh, all right, uh, the gentleman. Hi, my name is uh, Amit, Amit Kakkar from Novo Holdings. Uh, we, uh, we, I'm from Novo Holdings, and we are very active investors in the space, uh, including in AI. Uh, AI is one of our portfolio companies, just for transparency. But I was the initial pioneer of AI when it was known as computer-aided diagnostics in 2000, and I was a G. We had the first CAD for MRI to look at uh, cartilage damage and meniscus tear. Problem was, it was on Sun UltraSpark systems, which would take about two months to decipher any data at that time. I think my question is relevant to, you know, some of you are running hospitals and departments. And the question is on adoption. Uh, the challenge I see today, and I'm a doc, I'm an MD in oncology and nuclear medicine, so I've seen from the other side of the fence also. I think the challenge I see today is how open are the adopters in this? You, as uh, people who are running the hospital, the departments, are trying to make a difference both in terms of diagnosis, productivity. But at the other side are the users, like the radiologists or the oncologists, whether they're working on PET CT or an MRI or a CT scan or an X ray. What is the adoption rate and how can you influence that if you are convinced that the data is relevant, whether it's in cure, for example, to diagnose tuberculosis or lung cancer or heart failure? If there is compelling data available in your hands, are you able to influence the end users to be able to adopt these technologies? And I'm just talking about AI, but it could go down to genomics and some of the other areas. Thank you. I, I think as a provider, you need to provide a space where it's possible for 
um, new technology to come in. I, the word that comes to my mind when I think about getting engagement from physicians, as a physician myself, is really evangelizing. There's a lot of work that's needed to convince doctors um, about technology. Uh, sometimes we are using the same, uh, same, using Illumina for the same type of gene sequencing and just different tests. Same machine, but one brand they're okay with and the other brand they're not. I, I mean, it comes down to that, you know, and it's entirely same, same, different. <laughs> um, so a lot of, and, and I, I think you, you probably need to appeal to the scientific com community then go all the way up and find a champion and someone within the organization that is of an academic um, standing that you know, will be able to influence. I think when you looked at how, uh, was it Cleveland or Mayo, when they wanted to even change the way that they wanted to work well, by working with multi uh, centers that were focusing on disease, you know? I think it was Toby, he was the CEO then. He was a cardiothoracic surgeon. I think it would be really, really have been hard for, for the, the organization to move from a full private model to a salaried model with physicians coming on board and willing to become employees when they were practicing in a different way all along. And I think that, that academic leadership and that clinical leadership is so important um, to uh, organization adopting that. So that, that is my, my take on physician engagement. I think that that part is really important to solve for. Yeah, and every time someone startups come to me, I said I would love a great test, fantastic. You know, I think it's it might be very interesting, good thesis. Do you have a physician champion? That's the one thing I ask. Do you have a physician champion? And if they say no, I say maybe you should find a physician champion first that's willing to take that on, and then that that start that helps a lot. You know, I, I'll be willing to to incorporate it in. So that that's my answer to you. I think in addition to that, you just need to um, show what's in it for them, right? Obviously, if there's an AI and if you can tangibly, one, protect their financials, we're all human beings, right? That always plays, always, whether, whether it's over, sub or some way. Um, so as long as there is a confidence that, you know, it's not a replacement. And radiology AI conversations, we've been having a lot with Cure as well and others as well. Um, and one of the things is that, look, my medical legal liability doesn't go because I still need to sign it. Um, and, you know, I, I still have to do ultrasound, so I'm not able to reduce my manpower. Uh, what is in it for me? Um, I think that question needs to be addressed. Um, and once that gets addressed, um, I think they do come on board. Yeah, just, just one other word to follow on. I think it's important about, as a private provider, you're probably one step behind the, the, the scientific academic um, community, the public teaching hospitals. You know, I, usually doctors would, would have come to me wanting a new toy, a new technology. But uh, um, the Da Vinci robot is a great example that um, I actually, you know, the competition hospital had it and then I didn't really move until uh, Sirirat Hospital actually back then um, had one and then they had enough um, um, uh, academic leaders, professors that were actually very comfortable using it. And, and then once we saw that it was kind of here to stay, then we brought it into to Bramangrad. But then I had the job of convincing my urologist that, that, okay, maybe we should have this. Usually it's the other way around. So I had to bring the professor of the academics in and, and train them. And then it, it really is that scientific data that it will improve patient outcomes and save time um, and, and reduce costs in, in the long run that, that would convince them. Yeah. Thanks very much. I think uh, it's been very, very beneficial. I hope uh, whatever the sharing has been done will help you be able to outreach to that 2 billion uh, population market. <laughs> uh, I, I cannot help but um, the, uh, have this resonate in my mind, which is what I think some of the panelists, uh, Nam and Ritu, raised, that uh, sometimes we perceive that there are two sides to a door. And I think it's very important for companies in the innovation space to try to come in to understand what is our perspective on the other side of the door. And I think it will be a lot easier to work past some of the obstacles. So interestingly, on that note about AI, uh, in my hospital, I've had the specialists asking me for AI for endoscopy. So it's reverse, right? It's not the other way around. I didn't have to convince the specialists. But what goes on behind my mind as a hospital uh, uh, operator is how can I reduce costs from this? Um, what is my ROI? Will patients pay for this? Uh, so these are some of the questions that constantly uh, uh, revolves around our mind, uh, like what Ritu mentioned, uh, AI for radiology. The radiologist may be 
thinking that in a highly regulated environment, I'll still have to check, I'll still have to put my signature on it. So I hope um, some of this sharing has been useful. I want to thank our panelists of uh, Melvin, Ritu and Nam, and I'm sure uh, if you have any other questions, uh, they'll be very happy to, for you to approach them directly. So thank you very much. Thank you.